I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands on which we uh, meet today and pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging. Today we'll look at the what, why and how of self-management. What is self-management? Why you would choose to self-manage and how. Today we're hearing from three people who self-manage their NDS plan funding in three different ways and how it works for them. At the end of the session, you'll have the opportunity to ask your questions live by using the chat function. We're going to try and get to as many of the questions as we can. If we can't answer your question today, we will get back to you within 48 hours. Or alternatively, you can email your questions to lacinfo at uniting.org and we will get back to you with a response. What is self-management? Did you know, if you have an NDIS plan, you may be eligible to self-manage your funding? Self-management means a participant or their plan nominee chooses to be responsible for controlling their own support budget. You have the flexibility to choose a provider of your choice, including providers not registered with the NDIS. You can also negotiate the price you're willing to pay for supports. By choosing self-management, you can pay invoices directly from your nominated NDIS bank account. There are a range of support services available to assist with self-management, including software applications, bookkeeping and employment services. You have the option to self-manage all or only part of your funding supports. If you are interested in self-management, talk to your local area coordinator or planner about your options. Three ways to manage your NDIS plan. There are three different options that you may choose from to manage part or all of your NDIS plan funding. Agency managed. Your first option is agency managed. This is where you'll use a NDIS registered service provider to get the services and supports that you require. They will then bill the agency who will pay for it out of your plan funding. With an agency managed plan, the NDIA can only pay providers that are registered with the NDIS and cannot pay more than the NDIA set price limits. Plan Managed The second option is Plan Managed. This is where you can use an NDIS registered provider or a non-registered provider and a financial intermediary will pay for your services and supports out of your NDIS plan funding. When plan managing, your plan manager must be registered with the NDIS. Your plan manager cannot pay more than the NDIA set price limit for specific supports. Self-managed. The third option, which is what we're here to talk about today, is self-managed, where you can manage part or all of your plan funding. This allows for greater choice and control and flexibility in the services and supports that you use. You can use both registered service providers and non-registered providers. With this option, you will be billed directly for the services and supports that you receive. You will then pay for these services and supports out of your plan funding. When self-managing, you do not need a service booking for your self-managed supports, as you pay your providers directly. When you self-manage, the NDIS will provide funding for you to buy the supports and services you need to meet your goals. When choosing this option to manage your plan funding, it gives you the greatest choice and control and means that you have the greatest say and flexibility in getting those services and supports for you to lead an ordinary life. Why choose self-management? Today we'll be hearing from three people who self-manage in different ways. Jade directly employs his own staff. Peggy is a plan nominee who self-manages for her daughter and Athel self-manages using contractors. Did you self-manage your first plan? I actually didn't self-manage my first plan. Um, the reason being was I was new to the scheme. It was quite new. I'd heard a lot of myths and misconceptions uh, that it was really difficult. It was almost like running a small business. Um, I work full time. I travel a lot with work. I just didn't have the time or the energy to do it. So I thought there was a lot involved. Um, that was to start with? Yeah, I found it the same. Um, I'm a mum, I've got young kids and I work full time. I just thought it was something that I didn't have the time for. Now my first plan, uh, I didn't self-manage. I just started work as a, an LAC with Uniting. 
Uh, work was very hectic at the time with all the training and everything else that we were trying to get uh, get through and uh, I just felt I didn't have time. So, And there was also in my plan there were some capital items which I had to be agency managed and there was support coordination to organise that. Why did you choose to self-manage? I ended up choosing to self-manage because I actually saw that it gave me more flexibility and more choice and control. So I had a great uh, service provider before the NDOs came around. Uh, I was with that service for about seven years. They then became a registered service provider. Um, they were great, they, they were all I knew. And then I decided I can still use them, but get more value for money by actually self-managing. And then it gave me the option of actually using both a registered provider and non-registered providers. So that's probably the main reason why I actually chose to self-manage. And I found out through experience and talking to other people that it wasn't as time consuming or as involved as I thought. So just breaking down some of those myths and misconceptions that were sort of around at the start, I think that's a big reason why I end up self-managing. Yeah, I guess it's similar for me. Uh, you know, a busy lifestyle, busy family, um, sport every weekend, camping when we could, uh, just never ending. When I, I thought we didn't have time to to uh, self-manage initially. And then uh, I decided that uh, having worked in the industry for uh, a little while that uh, I would then, I had the skills to um, self-manage. I, I had um, the supports around me to help me self-manage. Yeah, we, um, I guess we chose to self-manage just around some flexibility. We live in a rural area. Um, and it became difficult to find um, providers or registered providers with capacity to take on, on the support that we needed at the time. Um, a lot of allied health services are not necessarily registered um, and wait lists with registered providers were quite long. So it was about urgency and flexibility for us. What has been your experience with self-management? I guess when I realised uh, self-management was going to be really easy, it was a no-brainer for me. I thought, well, that's something I needed to do. Um, and it also gave me that choice and control is uh, something that I believe I needed at the time. Yeah. Yeah, we, we um, looked into self-management and I guess with the, the work that I was doing at the time, I, I had a fair few resources available, resources that are available to everybody. Um, and I thought, well, you know, why not give it a go? There's nothing that we can lose by doing that. If it wasn't working out for us, we could have requested um, a review to have that changed. And I'm so glad I did. It's, it's just allowed us so much flexibility. One of the reasons I also, like you both decided to self-manage was because it was nowhere near as complex and time consuming as I thought it was. And it's given me the option to actually directly employ my own staff, which has given me so much more choice and freedom of how I get a service, when I get a service. It's also saved me lots of money not having a middleman. So instead of paying the overheads to a registered provider, I actually do that all myself and my staff get paid a much higher rate, which for me, I don't like change. I'm actually getting a much better quality of staff and I'm retaining really good staff, which is really, really important to me. Is self-management time consuming? You mentioned time, Jade. I'm interested to see with you direct hiring staff. How long does it take you roughly each fortnight to, to make your claims? It's a lot simpler than I thought. So you had to do three things. One was get correct workers' comp insurance. The second was I use an online um, rostering system, which my staff clock in, they clock out, and the timesheet goes straight to a bookkeeper uh, that's paid out of my core supports. He calculates the payroll, I make the claim, then automatically my staff are paid into their nominated bank accounts, the tax is withheld, and the superannuation is paid. Superannuation is paid. It's that simple. It takes me no longer to self-manage, um, directly employ my own staff, than it did to pay my plan management uh, provider. So 15, 20 minutes tops per fortnight. Yeah, wow. That, that's really interesting to hear because I think it probably takes about the same time once I log on um, and, and process the claims, um, I think probably about the same, about 15 minutes a fortnight. Yeah, I don't, well, I don't uh, use, I don't directly employ. Uh, I use contractors. It's uh, simple for me. 
Um, I get invoices emailed to me. Um, I pay them out of my bank account. Uh, then I can then I can claim uh, through the portal when when it suits me. Uh, it doesn't have to happen that day. It could be, uh, you know, next week when I do it again. It's, it's, uh, time is mine then. I, I control the time. Yeah, that's a really good point. One of the the things that I guess made us decide to self manage um, was sometimes there were more expensive things that we had to purchase and and go request reimbursement from our plan manager. And sometimes, um, you know, you'd need to wait, wait till the next payroll was done. It's not always convenient to be out of pocket um, for a bit of time. And with being able to um, claim for reimbursement directly from the portal, I know, you know, how long I'm going to have to be out of pocket. Or I can claim ahead if I know how much it's going to cost. Mm. It's a good point you make. For me, it's the freedom to actually, even though I do directly employ my own staff, I still have that security at the backup of actually using a registered provider if I need to, and I still use a registered provider for some of the other services and supports that I receive. But I can also use really great allied health professionals, for example, occupational therapy and physiotherapy uh, that have chosen not to re-register with the agency, and I actually get to negotiate the price a little bit, so it provides much better value for money um, and greater you know, flexibility. And like you two, I, I work full time. So I normally do my claims on a Monday night, once a fortnight um, when I get home from work and it's simple. Yeah, it fits around our lives, mm. works well. Yep. Yeah, I think it's good that um, you can make the NDIS fit you and not you have to fit the NDIS. That's a, that's a big uh, plus for me. Uh, I, I've always been uh, an independent guy and being able to self-manage is maintain that level of independence. Yeah. It's about getting supports that, that work for you as well and that fit, fit your lifestyle. Um, we use a mix of um, registered and unregistered providers. It depends on the skill set of the, the staff. Um, and, you know, we've had great experiences with both, but for us, it works to to engage certain supports through the registered provider. Um, and then we also contract um, some support as well. And that's just what works around our family lifestyle. It's another really great point you raise around value for money. Um, I've been using a registered provider for years and years um, for my continence products. And then I actually realized one day when I was in the chemist that I can buy the same goods and services from a chemist or a supermarket at almost half the price. So for me, value for money and the convenience of not having to place that order wait the 10 days and always being that organised, when I run out, I can just tuck up to the chemist or the supermarket, you know, pay for it and just make a claim and be reimbursed. The value for money is a, it's a huge point for me. Well, in time as well. Um, I'm, I'm not very organised at times and I found that if I forget to put an order in, um, I'm not having to think two weeks down the track or 10 days down the track. I can look in the cupboard and go, oh, I need more of that, um, and just go to the local shop and purchase it. Yeah, and, and that's, that makes a big difference. You're able to um, purchase those goods when you want, as you want. Um, as you said, Jade, you don't have to wait 10 days for them to arrive. It's just something uh, you, you can go into your local chemist or uh, you can go into your local supermarket, purchase what you need. Um, yeah, without a, without a 10 day delay. Yeah, that's right. And let's face it, we've probably all packed a suitcase and forgotten something. Mm -hmm. um, I remember before I was self-managing, um, we went away on a family holiday and I forgot to pack something. And I was thinking, oh no, I'm going to have to purchase this and I'll be out of pocket because I can't claim this back. Um, now, that's not a worry that I have to think about. How has life changed since you started self-managing? So pre-NDIS, I, I didn't have a, um, any funding as such. I was no, um, had, a, uh, had no programs with them or any other funding other than the CAS scheme, um, which supplied $400-odd dollars for continence products, uh, which is probably only a month's worth in reality. Um, and the taxi subsidy scheme, which is uh, just a... I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but that's a, you know it's a 50% um, subsidised in your taxi fares. Um, 
and that was only available if you were working as well. Another thing the NDIS has really changed is my family life. Um, I almost felt like a burden on my family at times. I think they were really worried about what was going to happen to me in the future, who would support me. Being under the S NDIS has made me the independent person I am. It's allowed me to work full time. It's allowed me to live independently in my own community where I choose to. And it's allowed my family to move on with their own lives. It's similar with my family. Um, what the NDIS has allowed them to do is go off and lead their own individual lives. Um, that's not saying that they don't care for me or don't uh, support me. But what it does mean is that they, it's given them the ability to build their uh, ability to help support me as I get older and, and, and my support needs increase. I think it's really nice to know that your family and your partner are your family and your partner, not your support network. I was just about to say, since having the NDIS, I'm able to be a mum again. Um, we do lots of therapy program at home um, and, and we provide lots of support. But prior to having NDIS, um, we were doing all of that. And it seemed quite big sometimes and I could tell that my daughter resented that sometimes. She wanted to be independent. So now we can just have fun as a mum and a daughter should. So before we were self-managing, um, I found it quite difficult to use our first NDIS support budget. There was lots left over after the first year. Um, and it wasn't that the need wasn't there. I just hadn't been able to engage the providers that we needed. Um, there were long waiting lists um, and not enough providers in our area at the time. And I think self-managing has opened that up a little bit more. I also feel more in control of understanding what's allocated in my budget um, and, and using that. So previously, um, we had a plan manager and they were wonderful at helping break down the budget and looking at service bookings and making sure that we had enough to cover that year. But now I'm able to log on to the portal and I know that if for some reason service gets cancelled, then that leaves a little bit extra to carry over to the next time. I feel really in control of the, the budget. So before I self-managed, I pretty much had to use um, agency registered providers and one of my really great providers now has decided not to re-register. So I probably wouldn't be able to use him anymore. Um, so I'm really glad that being a self-managed uh, participant, it gives me that option to use both registered providers and non-registered providers. It also helps me think outside of the square where I can actually engage staff and services from that I mightn't have actually been able to. I think also there's lots of spin-offs and byproducts from self-managing. So I think for a lot of people it's confidence. It's those soft skills you build up around budgeting, uh, time management, rostering, negotiating and actually working with people. So those soft skills have actually transferred into all areas of my life. So it's been a change for me. It's also given me the option to actually directly employ my staff. So I can employ better staff. I can retain better staff. Um, I still have that freedom and flexibility to use some of the great register providers out there that I need. Um, it's just that flexibility that I, that I really, really love about it. And it's not as anywhere near as complicated or as time consuming as I was once led to believe. So Ethel, um, as an Aboriginal man, um, pre self-management, do you think that the service and support you used actually met your cultural needs? No, uh, nowhere near what I needed. Um, the, uh, the plan managers um, didn't use any Aboriginal staff um, at, the to at that time. Uh, and I found it difficult um, to have some of those people come into my home and be um, doing work within my home, especially while I wasn't there. Uh, and I didn't feel safe with that. Um, I thought, I felt like I was being invaded. Uh, my privacy was being invaded in the home. And uh, it, it, it's really hard to explain, but when I decided to self-manage, I then got all that power, I got all that control, um, and I was able to choose who came to my home, who, who uh, did my laundry, who did my um, lawns, and who did the uh, clean the bathroom for me. And I felt in control with that and, and a lot more empowered. It's interesting you talk about 
feeling in control and empowered. I know for me um, and my family, it's been a big confidence boost. When we engage supports now, we're going in talking about what what's needed, um, mm. how we'd like that support to look, and and you know what it entails instead of only being able to choose from what's available to us. Mm. There's all this kind of incidental gold that you pick up. We're able to um, look for people within our community, look at the people that would be the right fit for working with my daughter, and then have those conversations. Um, I haven't chosen to direct hire, but it's something that I'm interested in after talking with you, Jade. Um, but we contract. So it's having that conversation with the person, um, you know, do you have your own ABN? Would you be interested in getting it? Um, what about insurances? What qualifications do you have? Do you have the relevant experience um, that we're looking for? My daughter communicates with sign language, so that's one of a really important thing for us. You know, do you want to come and meet my daughter or... Um, let's have a cup of coffee and get to know each other and just see whether it's the right fit. We feel really in control as a family of who, who's around. I think that's a good point around qualifications. So I find a lot of staff that work for some of the registered providers, you know, they've got to have a certificate three or certificate four. I don't require people with a certificate three or certificate four. I require people with honesty, integrity and common sense. I can pretty much train anyone to do the routine and look after me in the way that I want to be looked after, but I can't train common sense. Have you found self-management to be difficult? Self-management is not a, not a difficult thing. It uh, takes a few minutes every week, um, probably 15 minutes, um, just to uh, upload your payment request into the, into the portal. Um, yeah, that's, that's about all it takes for me. Um, I maintain all my records. Um, in, in email form so that they're there forever but simple it's a nice simple process yeah I was surprised how easy it was um, I'd, I'd read about it and I'd looked at the resources available on the NDIS website and I thought well, we may as well give it a go um, the portal is quite intuitive it's quite easy to to go through um, and to pop a payment request in doesn't take much time at all um, we have a different system of keeping our records. I have an expander file and um, I often, you know, I keep all the things that are not paid in the front and then once they're processing, um, you know, I wait until the, the payment has come into my bank account, pay them out to, to the providers and then put them in the back of the expander file. Jade, how do you keep your records? I'm pretty old school. Um, I'm more of a shoebox type of guy. Um, I've got a folder and it's got the year written on it. Um, any of the paper receipts I receive, for example, from my chemist or my supermarket or my lawnmower man, um, I just get them. Um, when I've claimed and paid them, I actually just pop them into the folder. Uh, all my other tax invoices, they come through um, the email. Yep. So I just keep them on email and the paper invoices I've always got there. So if I ever get audited, um, they're all there. It's quite simple to locate them. I don't have to shuffle through the folder for my paper-based receipts or just scan through my email. It's that simple. Yeah, I've heard some pretty um, different ways of doing it and it's interesting to see that we've all got different ways of doing it. I guess it's about working out what works for you. Um, True. And, you know, best practice is to actually load your tax invoice or your receipt straight into the portal um, in, the, in the My Payment Request um, tile. That's quite simple. Some people choose to use spreadsheets, upload them to the cloud, store them on USB chips. It's a good point. What works for you? sort of would maybe work for me, what works for Ethel might not. Yeah. You know, that just shows we're all individuals and there's just many different ways that we can do it. That's right. I did hear um, somebody that I worked with a while ago talked about creating an individual NDIS email. And so every receipt um, that they got, they either scanned it themselves and emailed it to that email address um, or they got the, the service providers to email to that email address as well, which meant if they were audited, they had every single receipt or invoice automatically in that email address. So it was just a matter of handing over all the information in there. It becomes routine after a while. It's not, um, not, uh, not definitely not hazardous to your health. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think with self-management, um, the whole process of logging on and making a claim is pretty much the same as logging on to internet banking or paying a phone bill over the internet. A lot of things that we do are so web-based now um, that transactions like that are, kind of in our everyday lives. 
For some people though, accessing the internet might be difficult. You can also self-manage and do manual claim forms. Probably the closest thing I can compare self-managing to is internet banking. It's quite simple. I get um, my staff to submit their timesheets uh, through their mobile phones once a fortnight. It goes to my bookkeeper. He runs the costs. It's sent to me. I make the payment request on a Monday. The money's in my account on a Tuesday and my staff are directly paid through that online software. So the tax is withheld, their superannuation's paid, their wages are paid. It's actually simple. It is the simplest thing that I've ever done and gives me so much more value for money and just allows me to keep and employ great staff. What advice do you have on self-management? If somebody was thinking about self-managing, um, I guess the bit of advice that I, I would give them is give it a go. Um, it's really quite simple. And if you do need some support, there are supports available for you. Um, you have your local area coordinators that you can go to. There's online resources. And it's, it's okay to ask questions. It's something new. Um, just give it a go. I guess if somebody was uh, uh, asked me about self-management, uh, whether they should or shouldn't go down that trail, I would uh, I'd definitely encourage them. Uh, it gives them, uh, especially in the Aboriginal community, gives gives those uh, participants um, the opportunity to have culturally appropriate services uh, because they are in control of those services. They're not uh, reliant on others and, and other organisations, code of practice or, um, or timelines. Um, being self-managed gives them the opportunity then to ensure that and it's, they can employ somebody from down the road to come up and mow their lawn. I mean, they don't have to uh, go looking in the yellow pages and find somebody. But it's, it, that highlights the importance that you feel safe with your supports, that you feel comfortable yeah. with your supports. Yeah, it's... yeah. If someone asks me about self-managing, I'd definitely encourage them to do it. If they didn't want to self-manage all their plan, they could actually self-manage part of it just to get their toe in the water and just to build that confidence to make sure it's a, it is right for them and it's something that they want to do. Um, I've dealt with a lot of people from lots of different cultures and different backgrounds and one of the things we're finding that people get out of it as a byproduct when they self-manage that number one, they're getting people from their own culture, getting people that speak their own language and they can employ people from their own community, which number one, keeps money in their community and that's actually employing and providing employment uh, for people that they know within that community. So there's lots and lots of great benefits and spin-offs from self-management. One of the big ones is being a person who's had a disability for 33 years, I've seen the system change a lot. Since people are self-managing their plans, we're changing the disability industry and the sector. We're making services more responsive and more customer service focused, which they should have been all along. Mm -hmm. So in a way, we're not just changing our own lives, but we're changing society. And we're changing the lives of others with disabilities who may not have even been born yet. So it's a really great thing knowing that what we're doing now is really gonna impact the future for people with disabilities and their families. I think it brings into power too that we're protected by consumer law. So what we purchase is in fact a product, I don't like using that word, but we're purchasing something and we have certain rights around receiving good quality supports. It's important to trust um, and feel comfortable with the type of support you're getting and for it to be right for you or your family. Yeah. Yep. But I think also, um, if I was talking to somebody who hadn't considered plan management, uh, self-management before, I would, I would suggest that at their next review, um, that they request training and plan management if they, if they don't think they currently have the skills to do it. Training and plan management, they will then just be able to decipher whether they are, are able to in the future or whether they're not. That's right. There's a couple of levels of support, I guess, to, to build your capacity to manage your plan. Sometimes you might need the support from your LAC. You might have a friend or family member that self-manages their own plan or plan for somebody else. Um, or you might need that formal training in plan management. There's lots of different ways around it. Yep. 
What are the benefits of self-management? So one of the benefits of self-managing is being able to decide what meets that reasonable and necessary criteria for ourselves. You know, is it value for money? Is it related to my daughter's disability? Is it going to help her achieve her goals? Is it going to cause a risk? Being able to have control over deciding those things ourselves has been wonderful. It ensures that the services that we receive are actually helping my daughter achieve her goals. It's a good way to stay on track, isn't it? To, you know, bring you back to, you know, what is it? Why is it here? Why am I engaging this service? Is there a better service? Is there better value for money? When I was, um, when I was managed in a different way than self-managed, I didn't really sort of see the money value in it. Yes, I had the money and it was going out of my plan, but when you're self-managing it, this is my money. I'm taking control of it. I want value for it. I'm not going to use the registered provider I did once before to provide my condensed products because I can get them for half price up the road where it's more convenient for me. So having that, it's going to save me money, give me more service and supports that I need, but also save the scheme money because at the end of the day, we need to make sure this works so it's sustainable, so it's there for all Australians for the entire lifetime. Is self-management for everyone? Self-management's not for everybody. Sometimes there are things that might prevent you from self-managing. I agree, self-management isn't for everyone. Not everyone will actually have the right to self-management depending on their personal situation or their past financial uh, history. It's a good idea to have that conversation with your local area coordinator though. They'll be able to point you in the direction. They'll also be able to maybe help you make that decision. They'll be able to talk about the responsibilities and also the risks. Yeah, and I think after you speak to, with your local area coordinator um, and, and they explain the risk involved, you will then be able to also determine whether you think you're going to be able to build those skills uh, to manage your plan safely yeah. and efficiently. What are the responsibilities of self-management? With any great opportunity or award does come responsibility and people need to be aware that they do have responsibilities around their record keeping in case they are audited, around making sure that the service is value for money, and making sure that it relates to your disability and helps you achieve the goals that you've set out to achieve. That is a good thing for me that people just need to be aware of. Yeah, I think it's important. Mm, sure. A few people have asked me before what happens if they claim from the wrong support category. I, I kind of explained to them it's not, it's not a huge deal. Be transparent talk to your local area coordinator or give the NDIS a call. Explain to them what's happened. There's a difference between a mistake and wrongfully claiming funds or wrongfully using funds. At the end of the day, we are all human. We may make a mistake, but being transparent and open and honest about it, you know, what more could they ask for? Coming up, how to self-manage. After that, a question and answer session. If you'd like to leave a question, go to the chat function or send us an email at lacinfo at uniting.org and we'll get back to you within 48 hours.
Welcome back. Our next topic is how to self-manage. The three ways to self-manage your NDIS plan. There are three ways in which you can choose to self-manage your NDIS plan funding. Option A is to fully self-manage all of your budget. This will give you flexibility in engaging the services and supports you need to meet your goals. The second option is to partially self-manage your NDIS plan funding. You may choose to do this as you're not comfortable with managing all of your budget, or you'd just like to try to see how you go. There are times when you will be required to use an NDIS registered service provider. These things normally occur around behavioural support intervention plans and when you have capital in your budget to do home modifications, vehicle mods, or large scale assistive technology. The third option is to self-manage as a nominee. What this means is someone else will self-manage your NDIS plan funding for you. The most common example of this is where parents choose to self-manage their child's NDIS funding to get the service and support they need to meet their goals. How to pay for supports. There are two different ways to pay for your supports. One is make a payment request via the portal. Uh, once your money is in your account, then you can pay your provider. The second way is to pay the support yourself. You can pay for it out of your own pocket. Lodge a payment request via the portal uh, and the money will be transferred into your nominated bank account, usually within 48 hours. If you don't have the money to, and your service provider needs to be paid on the day of the service, you can lodge a payment request in advance and that money will be released into your bank account and enable you to pay your service provider on that day. One of the advantages of self-managing is that you are responsible for negotiating the prices of services and supports that you receive. This means that at times you may be able to negotiate rates below the NDIS price guide and for some services and supports you may pay above a benchmark amount. How to make a claim when self-managing your funding. Open my.gov.au in your browser. At the welcome page, enter your username or email address, then enter your password, followed by clicking on the sign in button. This will take you to the enter your security code page or the security question page. This will depend on your choice of security verification. In this example, we're using a security code option. Then click on the Next button. This will take you to the next page with a list of your services. Click on the NDIS logo. To request a payment, select the My Payment Request tile. On the next page, select the Add My Payment Request tile. This will take you to the Add Payment Request page. Here you can see Support Start Date, Support End Date and Support Category. Select a Support Start Date from either the drop-down calendar or simply type in a date. Then enter the Support End Date followed by selecting a support category. This video uses examples of support categories and budget amounts that will differ depending on each NDIS participant's individual circumstances. Finally enter a payment amount. If this is the only payment, select the next button. If you wish to make additional claims, select Add Another. In this example, we'll add another two claims.
Once you've completed your claims, select Next. This will give you a preview of your payment request details along with a summary of category payment requests. At the bottom you'll notice a declaration tick box. You need to select this, agreeing that the information is correct in order to proceed. Then click on the Submit button. This brings us to the confirmation page which shows that your payment requests have been received. That's it. You've now successfully completed a payment request. The funds will be transferred to your nominated account within 24 to 48 hours. Once you've successfully made a claim, you can then choose to upload a document relating to that payment request. You can do so by clicking on the My Payment Request tile on the My Place portal home screen. Click on View My Payment Request. Then select Payment Request Type. Select View Submitted Payment Request. Enter the submitted date and or the support start and end date. Click Search. Select the payment request number of the request you'd like to view. Click Upload Document to attach the required document. Select Invoice, Receipt or Other Form depending on what you'd like to upload. Create a document name. Enter a description. Click Browse to add the document you'd like to upload. Select the file. Select Upload. You've now successfully uploaded a document relating to a payment request. You can then review or cancel a payment request. You can do this by clicking on the My Payment Request tile on the My Place Portal Home screen. Then select View Payment Request. Then select Payment Request Type. Click on View Submitted Payment Request. Enter the submitted date and or the support start and end date. Click Search. Select the payment request number of the request you'd like to view. If all you'd like to do is view, your action is complete. If you'd like to cancel, click Cancel Payment. Select Yes or No regarding the cancellation of payment. You will now receive either an invoice if the payment status was listed as paid, or the amount will be offset against future payment requests. More information on using the MyPlace portal can be found on the NDIS website. You can do this by entering Portal Guide in the search bar at the top right of the NDIS homepage and then select How to use the MyPlace portal. The three categories in your budget. Your NDIS budget may contain three categories. Core, Capacity Building and Capital. Your core budget may contain four categories. Daily Activities, which you can use to purchase supports such as meal preparation and personal care. Social and Community Participation, which can be used to purchase supports such as accessing the community or day programs. Consumables, which can be used to purchase supports such as continence products or Level 1 and Level 2 assistive technology. and 
you may have a transport component, if eligible. A capacity building budget is allocated to an individual plan to help that person build skills and independence towards achieving their goals. There are nine categories within the capacity building support budget. Your capital budget may include higher level assistive technology, such as power wheelchair or home and vehicle modifications. These things are generally items that you may purchase once and require assessment, recommendation, quotes and approval before purchasing. Often people get confused when it comes to the capacity building supports that are in their plan. There are two versions of your plan. One, a paper based that you'll receive in the mail. The second is your portal plan that you receive in your My Place portal. In your paper-based plan, capacity building supports are listed as improved, whereas in your NDIS My Place portal, they're listed as CB, which stands for capacity building. Please do not be confused. These are the same, just worded differently. So just remember, every time you see CB, it stands for capacity building. Responsibilities when self-managing. When self-managing your NDIS plan, you have some responsibilities. This includes monitoring your budget, making sure that you have the funding to last your whole plan period, as you would if your agency or plan managed. With self-management, it is your responsibility to find and purchase the supports that you need. It is also your responsibility to collect assessments and reports. This is so when it comes around to plan review, your LAC has the best information to develop your new plan. You need to keep records of purchases made using your self-managed funding. These include all invoices and receipts. You may be audited. As we heard earlier, there are lots of different ways to do this and it's important that you pick a way that you find suits you. You must keep these records for five years. Keep in mind that when you're using an unregistered service provider, they may not have been through the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission stringent accreditation process. This doesn't mean they're not going to provide a great service or support to you, it just means they haven't been through the process. All NDIS registered service providers have been verified or certified by the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission. Just remember, even when you are self-managing your NDIS plan funding, there may be times when you are required to use an NDIS registered service provider. These are times when that service provider needs to be certified by the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission. When developing a behavioural management plan, for example, you will be required to use a certified NDIS service provider. Also, when using large-scale home modifications or assistive technology assessments, they must be done by an NDIS accredited occupational therapist or service provider. This is to ensure that you receive the service or support that you require by someone who's been fully trained and accredited in this service provision. Another thing to keep in mind is that you have rights. When you purchase services and supports, you are a consumer and therefore protected by consumer law. How to make a complaint. It is your right to complain if you haven't received adequate service. To make a complaint, talk to your service provider about their internal complaints process. Call the NDIS directly on 1800 800 110. Contact the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission or Fair Trading. If you cannot resolve your issue, you can contact the Commonwealth Ombudsman. You are not alone on your NDIS self-management journey. There are plenty of wonderful resources to help support you, such as this NDIS self-management booklet, which can be found on the NDIS website. Also, if you have any questions, reach out to your local area coordinator. They're a wealth of knowledge and they're there to support you. Thank you for your time. We'll now go into the question and answer section. If you'd like to ask a question, go to the chat function or send us an email at lacinfo at uniting.org and we'll get back to you within 48 hours.